Sit. Speak. Stay. Good dog. Good dog. Oh, hello. This story that I'm about to read you is about mice. And it reminded me of a family of mice that moved into my house last year. They lived in a hole in the wall near the kitchen. There was a father and a mother and four little kids. Now, before bedtime, I'll often bake a loaf of bread and let it cool overnight because, well, there's nothing better than fresh bread in the morning. Well, the family of mice liked it too and started eating it up after I went to sleep. This went on for weeks. I'd bake bread and they'd eat it up all in the middle of the night. I thought about using mouse traps, but that seems so uncivilized. Finally, I decided to write them a note. It said, Dear Mouse Family, from now on, whenever I bake bread, I'll leave half the loaf for you outside your front door. In return, all I ask is that you leave the other half for me to eat in the morning. Yours, in all fairness, Mrs. P. Then I folded the note and stuck it in their house. The next morning, I got up and discovered that the mice had eaten the bread outside their door and my half of the bread too, every last crumb. And there, sitting at the bottom of my empty baking tin, I found a little note. And that little note said, Dear Mrs. P, don't blame us. Everyone knows mice can't read. Ha ha, love the mice family. <laughs> well, I had to admit they were pretty funny mice. <laughs> oh, they made me laugh. And I laughed all the way to the animal shelter where I adopted a cat that sleeps all night in my kitchen. <laughs> he doesn't like bread and never, absolutely never writes me funny notes. Now, this little story is one of Aesop's fables, and it's about two mice and two different ways of life, and it's called the city mouse and the country mouse. Once, a little mouse who lived in the country invited a little mouse from the city to visit him. When the city mouse sat down to dinner, he was surprised to find that the country mouse had nothing to eat except barley and grain. Really? He said, you do not live well at all. You should see how I live. I have all sorts of fine things to eat every day. You must come to visit me and see how nice it is to live in the city. The little country mouse was glad to do this, and after a while, he went to the city to visit his friend. The very first place that the city mouse took the country mouse to see was the kitchen cupboard of the house where he lived. There, on the lowest shelf behind some stone jars, stood a big paper bag of brown sugar. The little city mouse gnawed a hole in the bag and invited his friend to nibble for himself. The two little mice nibbled and nibbled and the country mouse thought he'd never tasted anything so delicious in his life. He was just thinking how lucky the city mouse was when suddenly the door opened with a bang and in came the cook to get some flour. Run! whispered the city mouse, and they ran as fast as they could get to the little hole where they had come in. The little country mouse was shaking all over when they got safely away, but the little city mouse said, that is nothing. She will soon go away, and then we can go back. After the cook had gone away and shut the door, they stole softly back, and this time the city mouse had something new to show. He took the little country mouse into a corner on the top shelf where a big jar of dried prunes stood open. After much tugging and pulling, they got a large dried prune out of the jar onto the shelf and began to nibble at it. This was even better than the brown sugar. The little country mouse liked the taste so much that he could hardly nibble fast enough. But all at once, in the midst of their eating, there came a scratching at the door and a sharp, loud meow. What is that? said the country mouse. The city mouse just whispered, shh, and ran as fast as he could to the hole. The country mouse ran after, you may be sure, as fast as he could. And as soon as they were out of danger, the city mouse said, that was the old cat. She's the best mouser in town. If she once gets you, you are lost. This is very terrible, 
said the little country mouse. Let us not go back to the cupboard again. No, said the city mouse. I will take you to the cellar. There's something special there. So the city mouse took his little friend down the cellar stairs into a big cupboard where there were so many shelves. On the shelves were jars of butter and cheeses in bags and out of bags and overhead hung bunches of sausages and there were spicy apples in barrels standing about. It smelled so good that it went to the little country mouse's head. He ran along the shelf and he nibbled at a cheese here and a bit of butter there until he saw an especially rich, very delicious smelling piece of cheese on a queer little stand in a corner. He was just on the point of putting his teeth into the cheese when the city mouse saw him. Stop! Stop! cried the city mouse. That is a trap. The little country mouse stopped and said, what's a trap? That thing is a trap, said the city mouse. The minute you touch the cheese with your teeth, something comes down on your head hard and you're dead. The little country mouse looked at the trap and he looked at the cheese and he looked at the city mouse. If you'll excuse me, he said, I think I will go home. I'd rather have barley and grain to eat and eat it in peace and comfort than have brown sugar and dried prunes and cheese and, and be frightened to death all the time. So the little country mouse went back to his home and there he stayed all the rest of his life. The end. Oh, hello. <laughs> the first time I rode an elephant was in India when I was 24. I went to visit my boyfriend, Dharmesh, who was an actor who starred in several popular Bollywood movies. Now, Dharmesh was filming a movie in the jungle, and the only way to get there was by riding on an elephant. So I went to Hertz Elephant Rental, picked out a grey mid-sized model, tossed my luggage on his back, climbed up into the saddle, or howda, and away we went. What I didn't know was that although elephants are big, they're also very sensitive and fragile. And after an hour, the elephant began to complain about the saddle rubbing his soft skin. It was very, very soft and tender. So I climbed down, took off the saddle, and started walking alongside him. After another hour, the elephant began to complain that my luggage was aggravating an old back injury and that he absolutely positively could not go on. So I took off my luggage and began dragging it behind me. After another hour, the elephant began to complain that he was so weary from the heat that he could no longer hold up his own trunk and that dragging it on the ground was terribly painful. So I swung his trunk up over my shoulder and kept walking, pulling my luggage behind me. Finally, two days later, we arrived on the movie set. I was as hot and tired as a person could be. Several other elephants were standing round the set, and when they saw me dragging my luggage and carrying my elephant's trunk on my shoulder, they gathered round. My elephant whispered something to them I couldn't hear, and they started high-fiving him with their trunks, and then they all pointed at me and laughed and laughed until they cried. And that, my dear friends, is how I learned that not only are elephants sensitive and fragile creatures, but they're also very, very tricky. Now, this is a story about how elephants got their first trunks. It's by Rudyard Kipling, and it's called The Elephant's Child. In the high and far off times, the elephant, oh best beloved, had no trunk. He had only a blackish bulgy nose as big as a boot. 
and that he could wriggle from side to side, but he couldn't pick up things with it. But there was one elephant, a new elephant, an elephant's child, who was full of satiable curiosity. And that means he asked ever so many questions. And he lived in Africa, and he filled all Africa with his satiable curiosities. He asked his tall aunt, the ostrich, why her tail feathers grew just so, and his tall aunt, the ostrich, spanked him with her hard, hard claw. He asked his tall uncle, the giraffe, what made his skin spotty, and his tall uncle, the giraffe, spanked him with his hard, hard hoof. And still, he was full of satiable curiosity. He asked his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, why her eyes were red. And his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, spanked him with her broad, broad hoof. And his uncle, the hairy baboon, he asked him why melons tasted just so. And his hairy uncle, the baboon, spanked him with his hairy, hairy paw. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. He asked questions about everything that he saw or heard or felt or smelt or touched. And all his uncles and his aunts spanked him. And still he was full of satiable curiosity. One fine morning in the middle of the procession of the equinoxes, this satiable elephant's child asked a new fine question that he had never asked before. He asked, What does the crocodile have for dinner? Well, then everybody said, Hush! in a loud and dreadful tone, and they spanked him immediately and directly without stopping for a long time. By and by, when that was finished, he came upon Cola Cola Bird, sitting in the middle of a way to bit thorn bush. And he said, My father has spanked me, and my mother has spanked me, and all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my satiable curiosity. And still I want to know what the crocodile has for dinner. Then the Cola Cola Bird said with a mournful cry, Go to the banks of the great gray, green, greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, and find out. That very next morning, when there was nothing left of the equinoxes, because the procession had proceeded according to precedent, this satiable elephant's child took a hundred pounds of bananas, the short little red kind, and a hundred pounds of sugar cane, the long purple kind, and seventeen melons, the greeny crackly kind, and said to all his dear families, Goodbye, I'm going to the great grey green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, to find out what the crocodile has for dinner. And they all spanked him once for luck, though he asked them most politely to stop. Then he went away, a little warm, but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up. He went from Grahamstown to Kimberley, and from Kimberley to Kama's country, and from Kama's country he went east by north, eating melons all the time, till at last he came to the banks of the great grey-green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, precisely as the Cola Cola bird had said. Now, you must know and understand, O oh beloved one, that till that very week and day and hour and minute, this satiable elephant's child had never seen a crocodile and did not know what one was like. It was all his satiable curiosity. The first thing that he found was a bi-colored python rock snake curled around a rock. Excuse me, said the elephant's child most politely, but have you seen such a thing as a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? Sss, have I seen a crocodile, said the bi-colored python rock snake in a voice of dreadful scorn. So what will you ask me next? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but could you kindly tell me what he has for dinner? Then the bicolored python rock snake uncoiled himself very quickly from the rock and spanked the elephant's child with his scalesome, flailsome tail. That is odd, said the elephant's child, because my father and my mother and my aunt and my uncle, not to mention my other aunt, the hippopotamus, and my other uncle, the baboon, have all spanked me for my satiable curiosity. And I suppose this is the same thing. So 
He said goodbye very politely to the bicolored python rock snake and helped to coil him up on the rock again and went on, a little warm, but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up, till he trod on what he thought was a log of wood at the very edge of the great grey-green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees. But it was really the crocodile who best beloved. And the crocodile winked one eye like this. Excuse me, said the elephant's child most politely, but do you happen to have seen a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? Then the crocodile winked the other eye and lifted half his tail out of the mud, and the elephant's child stepped back most politely because he did not wish to be spanked again. Come hither, little one, said the crocodile. Why do you ask such things? Excuse me, said the elephant's child most politely, but my father has spanked me, my mother has spanked me, not to mention my tall aunt the ostrich, and my tall uncle the giraffe, who can kick ever so hard, as well as my broad aunt the hippopotamus, and my hairy uncle the baboon, and including the bicolored python rock snake with the scalesome flailsome tail just up the bank, who spanks harder than any of them, and so if it's quite all the same to you, I don't want to be spanked anymore. Come hither, little one said the crocodile, for I am the crocodile. And he wept crocodile tears to show it was quite true. Then the elephant's child grew all breathless and panted and kneeled down on the bank and said, You are the very person I've been looking for all these long days. Will you please tell me what you have for dinner? Come hither, little one, said the crocodile, and I'll whisper. Then the elephant's child put his head down close to the crocodile's musky tusky mouth and the crocodile caught him by his little nose, which up to this very week, day, hour and minute had been no bigger than a boot, though much more useful. I think, said the crocodile, and he said it between his teeth like this, I think to this day I'm going to begin with the elephant child. And this, oh, best beloved, the elephant's child was so much annoyed, and he said, speaking through his nose like this, Then go! You heard it be! Then the bicolored python rock snake scuffled down from the bank and said, My young friend, if you do now immediately and instantly pull as hard as you can, it is my opinion that your acquaintance in the large pattern leathered ulster, and by this he meant the crocodile, will jerk you into yonder limpid stream before you can say Jack Robinson. This is the way that bicolored python rock snakes always talk. Then the elephant's child sat back on his little haunches and pulled and pulled and pulled, and his nose began to stretch. And the crocodile floundered into the water, making it all creamy with great sweeps of his tail, and he pulled and pulled and pulled, and the elephant child's nose kept on stretching, and, and the elephant's child spread all his little four legs and pulled and pulled and pulled, and his nose kept on stretching, and the crocodile thrust his tail like an oar, and he pulled and pulled and pulled, and at each pull, the elephant's child's nose grew longer and longer, and it hurt him, hygious. Then the elephant child felt his leg slipping, and he said through his nose, which was now nearly five feet long, This is too much for me. Then the bicolored python rock snake came down from the bank and knotted himself in a double clove hitch round the elephant child's hind legs and said, Srash, an inexperienced traveler, we will now seriously devote ourselves to a high little tension, because if we do not, it is my impression that yonder self-propelling man of war with the armor plated upper deck, and by this, O oh best beloved, he meant the crocodile, will permanently vitiate your future careers. This is the way that all bi-colored python rock snakes always talk. So he pulled 
and the elephant's child pulled, and the crocodile pulled, but the elephant's child and the bicolored python rock snake pulled hardest. And at last, the crocodile let go all of the elephant child's nose with a plop that you could hear all up and down the Limpopo. Then the elephant's child sat down most hard and sudden, but first he was careful to say thank you to the bicolored python rock snake, and next he was kind to his poor pulled nose and wrapped it all up in cool banana leaves and hung it in the great grey green greasy Limpopo to cool. What are you doing that for? said the bicolored python rock snake. Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but my nose is badly out of shape and I'm waiting for it to shrink. Then you'll have to wait a long time, said the bicolored python rock snake. Some people do not know what is good for them. The elephant's child sat there for three days waiting for his nose to shrink, but it never grew any shorter. And besides, it made him squint. For, oh, best beloved, you will see and understand that the crocodile had pulled it out into a really, truly trunk, the same as all elephants have today. At the end of a third day, a fly came and stung him on the shoulder. And before he knew what he was doing, he lifted up his trunk and hit that fly dead with the end of it. Svantage, number one, said the bicolored python rock snake. She couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Try and eat a little now. Before he thought what he was doing, the elephant's child put out his trunk and plucked a large bundle of grass, dusted it clean against his forelegs, and stuffed it into his mouth. Vantage number two, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Don't you think the sun is very hot here? Well, it is, said the elephant's child. And before he thought what he was doing, he slooped up a sloop of mud from the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo and slapped it on his head, where it made a cool, sloopy, schlossy mud cap all trickly down behind his ears. Vantage number three, said the bicolored python rock snake. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Now, how do you feel about being spanked again? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but I should not like it at all. How would you like to spank somebody, said the bicolored python rock snake. I should like it very much indeed, said the elephant's child. Swell, said the bicolored python rock snake. You will find that new nose of yours is very useful to spank people with. Thank you, said the elephant's child. I'll remember that. And now I think I'll go home to all my dear families and try. So the elephant's child went home across Africa, frisking and whisking his trunk. When he wanted fruit to eat, he pulled fruit down from a tree instead of waiting for it to fall as he used to do. And when he wanted grass, he plucked grass up from the ground instead of going on his knees, as he used to do. When the flies bit him, he broke off the branch of a tree and used it as a fly whisk. And he made himself a new, cool, slushy, squashy mud cap whenever the sun was hot. When he felt lonely walking through Africa, he sang to himself down his trunk, and the noise was louder than several brass bands. He went especially out of his way to find a broad hippopotamus, she was no relation of his, and he spanked her very hard to make sure that the bicolored python rock snake had spoken the truth about his new trunk. The rest of the time, he picked up the melon rinds that he had dropped on his way to the Limpopo, for he was a tidy pachyderm. One dark evening, he came back to all his dear families, and he coiled up his trunk and said, How do you do? Well, they were very glad to see him and immediately said, Well, come here and be spanked for your... Satiable curiosity. Pooh, said the elephant's child. I don't think you people know anything about spanking, but I do, and I'll show you. Then he uncurled his trunk and knocked two of his dear brothers head over heels. Oh, bananas, said they. Where'd you learn that trick, and what have you done to your nose? I got a new nose from the crocodile on the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River said the elephant's child. I asked him what he had for dinner, 
and he gave me this to keep. It looks very ugly, said his hairy uncle, the baboon. It does, said the elephant's child, but it's very useful. And he picked up his hairy uncle, the baboon, by one hairy leg and hove him into a hornet's nest. Then the elephant's child spanked all his dear families for a long time till they were very warm and greatly astonished. He pulled out his tall ostrich ant's tail feathers and he caught his tall uncle the giraffe by the hind leg and dragged him through a thorn bush and he shouted at his broad aunt the hippopotamus and blew bubbles into her ear when she was sleeping in the water after meals. But he never let anyone touch Cola Cola Bird. At last, things grew so exciting that his dear families went off one by one in a hurry to the banks of the great grey-green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees to borrow new noses from the crocodile. When they came back, nobody spanked anybody anymore. And ever since that day, O oh best beloved, all the elephants you will ever see, besides all those you won't, have trunks precisely like the trunk of the satiable elephant's child. The end.